series of the 2012, soon to be 13, academic year. So thank you all for coming. Um, I think as you came in, you were offered a little card to write any questions that might come up during our um, speaker's speech. And we will have a little question and answer afterwards uh, at about 4.45. So please, as you're um, listening and inter interacting with our speaker, if you think of some things that you would like to ask, write them on the little card. Phyllis, I see she's modeling them back there. She's happy and she will be collecting them from you. So um, please do that because we'd like to hear from you. And at this time, I think we are ready to begin. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. Eduardo Ochoa, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's really great to see such a uh, strong audience uh, here to hear uh, Candace Steele uh, talk to us about uh, the work of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University. We have faculty, staff, and members of the community, including uh, colleagues from other educational institutions in the area that are joining us today, and so it's a very exciting for us. Uh, this is part of a series that we have this year on the covering uh, innovation in higher education. Uh, we are uh, really uh, coping with uh, a new environment with a lot of turbulence right now. Uh, we face challenges in funding. Uh, fortunately, Proposition 30 passed, and so we're <laughs> I'm going to quote myself in a mixed metaphor that I used in uh, the Monterey Herald. That, you know, I said, we avoided a train wreck, but we're still not off the hook. So we really are in a situation where at the same time that we're facing tremendous cost pressures and, and reduction in state support for college higher education, there's also uh, incredible innovation taking place uh, in the use of information technology and also in advances in learning science and the understanding of how the brain works and how learning takes place. We are poised and on the verge of really uh, making teaching and learning uh, a mature uh, applied science uh, where we really go start from the, the insights of basic research uh, to designing and engineering how we can do our teaching and learning to be most effective and using technology as well as part of that. So the Open Learning Initiative uh, has uh, really been a leader, a, a, um, a pioneer in, in that kind of evidence-based advances in teaching and learning. So it's great that we open with Candice Steele today, who really, uh, really embodies that, uh, personifies that that effort uh, nationally. And you know she's uh, ubiquitous in our classes. <laughs> she's spreading the gospel of what what they do. And uh, we already have some. Uh, she told us today earlier. We already have um, uh, some of our campuses already working with uh, some of the innovations that they have developed. So we're looking forward to, to hearing what she has to tell us and to uh, work with uh, our campus community and others to, to incorporate some of these advances uh, and help improve the quality of teaching and learning for our students and even uh, more critically, help increase the capacity that we have to deliver education um, to uh, to a, a broader uh, segment uh, of our of our students. So, uh, with that further ado, let me introduce Candice Steele. Okay. So, um, I know we have the question cards, and I encourage you to go ahead and write questions, and we'll have a section for questions and answers at the end. But I also really like interaction with human people in real time. So if, you're, if a question is burning for you or it, you're writing some long treatise on the card um, and you want to just ask the question out while I'm talking, please feel free to do so. Um, so, because I feed off of the conversation. So what I'm going to do is just basically walk us through some of the work that we're doing at the Open Learning Initiative. And I'll start off for those of you who haven't heard of the Open Learning Initiative. Basically, what it is is simply open meaning accessible, open to everyone, online learning environments that are based on the science of learning and are designed to address that dual challenge of both increasing productivity and improving quality. There, there. Did it work? There. 
So I was going to give you an example, a simple example of when we say the science of learning, which is an emerging field that involves cognitive psychologists, anthropologists, human-computer interaction experts, software engineers, lots of folks coming together to try and understand human learning. And as they do their research, we can extract some principles from what they're learning and use that to inform the design of our course. And that's where we sort of start, but it goes beyond that. But let me just start with that first most simplistic way of incorporating learning science into design. One of the things we know from learning research is that feedback, effective, timely, context-specific feedback will support students in their learning. So if you take that pretty simple principle and think about, okay, given that, how do we use the technology? Do we just record somebody lecturing and present that? There's not a lot of feedback that the student is getting from that. So instead, we can think about, do we design activities? How do we design an activity to give the student immediate feedback? So I'm going to give a small example out of one of our courses. This is our engineering statics course, which is a sophomore level course. How many engineers do I have in the room? OK, so a couple of you will remember this. And some of you may remember trying to do this, and that's why you decided not to be engineering majors. <laughs> So, um, so it's a simple, pro pretty straightforward problem. We give the, the student three forces, and we ask the student simply to tell us what's the direction and the magnitude of the sum. So the student can quickly just type in. They can work on a piece of paper on the side, type in the answer, and the system will give them immediate feedback. In this case, the immediate feedback is uh, that's not quite right. So the student can then ask for a hint by pressing that little hint button. And the system will see now the purpose, where this particular activity falls in the course, is an opportunity for the student to assess their own learning. It's a self-assessment opportunity. So the system reminds the student, you know, the, the purpose right here is for you to see if you can do this. So see if you can do it. If you need some help, we'll be happy to give it to you. And the student clicks there to get some extra help. And the system says, well, remember, the first step is to resolve each of the forces into their components. So go ahead and try doing that. And again, the student can just type in the, the first sub-step, and they'll get, if they're not sure what to do, they can ask for a hint. And again, the hint will remind them of what, can we, is there a way to move this up a little bit on the screen so you can see the whole hint? In any case, you can see that the, the first thing the system does is remind the student how to start thinking about approaching the problem. They can ask for a next level of hint which starts to scaffold them through exactly how to approach the problem until we get to the third level hint, which we call the bottom out hint. Many people simply call the answer. <laughs> so, the, so the student can say, this is the formula, this is the answer, go ahead and type that in. So the student can type that in and go on to the next part of the problem. And I'm going to, uh, and so they finish that first step, which is resolving each of the forces into the components. And the system says, great, now can you finish the problem? If the, system can the student can just try and finish the problem, or if not, they can ask for additional scaffolding and help. And so now I'm just going to fast forward so that you can see that the student has actually been able to finish the problem. But this particular student has asked for a lot of help and scaffolding along the way. So the system says, great that you were able to do this, but actually we would expect that at this point you would be able to do this without all this help and support. So you might want to try again. And if the student clicks to try again, the system will give them a new problem. All the hints and feedback, all the graphical representation targets the particular problem the student is, is attempting to solve. So the idea here is to give the student 24-7 support, infinitely patient support in supporting the student to build fluency in this procedure. Any questions about that? Yes? What came before this? What came before this? OK, so you're right that I said that this is a point in the course where the student is being asked to, to assess. Now, what came before a did I, we call these did I get this. What came before the did I get this in any, any OLI course actually varies a lot by course. In this particular course, we always start, well, in all courses, we start off with what's the big picture? What's the larger conceptual construct that we want the students to use for all these little discrete pieces that they're learning? How do, they, how do these hang together in a, in a conceptually meaningful whole that's authentic to the domain? So we start off presenting the big picture, 
And then as students move through the different discrete components, the actual presentation, like this one in the summing vectors, we give them a real life um, occurrence of where you might see these forces concurrently coming together, like in a pool table. So they'll see a little simulation of, uh, you know, a pool cue hitting a pool ball in one direction, and then a couple pool, pool, pool cues hitting the pool ball from a couple of directions. And then if you sum those forces, wh what's the trajectory of the, the pool ball? So kind of a real life experience of where this kind of approach would be demonstrated, and then the translation into a graphical representation. So what do the pool balls look like in a graphical representation? And then the translation into a mathematical equation. And all of that, they're sort of walked through, either by reading, simulations, or what we call short walkthroughs, which are very short uh, demonstrations of voice over graphical representation. And then usually a learn by doing activity where they're asked to put whatever this subset of knowledge into practice, trying some kind of task. And then when they've gotten all through that, that's usually a couple screenfuls, then they get to a did I get this, where they get an opportunity to assess whether or not they, they grasp that concept. Um, another thing that, so this work uh, that these little tutor activities, these mini tutors, is based on work that we've been doing at Carnegie Mellon for about the past 15 or 20 years in this area of cognitive tutors. Now, cognitive tutors are basically just pieces of software that are intended to act like a good human tutor. So they basically, when the student's just working along, they hang back. But as you can see, there's always that hint button. So if the student struggles and needs help, they can ask for help. Or if the student starts to go too far off path where it seems appropriate to intervene, the system will intervene and give feedback. Now, usually what people are thinking along this point is great for building procedural knowledge, like how to sum forth vectors. But really, at a college level, we want our students to do more than just build procedural knowledge on all these little discrete concepts and skills. They really need to synthesize, apply, when confronted with novel situations, be able to bring to bear this knowledge. We agree. So that's why when we're, uh, when we're thinking about how we structure the course, we don't think about just the little individual activities, but how they fit together in a coherent whole. So, for example, when we were doing chemistry, um, one of the things we were observing uh, students at Carnegie Mellon is they were really good at math when they came uh, to do chemistry at Carnegie Mellon. And when we were teaching them stoichiometry, uh, they were very good at solving the paper and pencil problems without having any idea how that connected to chemistry or how the chemistry connected to the real world. So we switched how we taught stoichiometry to start them off with how is this tool at all useful? And a real world problem is the arsenic contamination of the water supply in Bangladesh. So when they start the course, the first thing they get is a little mini documentary that explains this real world problem. Then they get put in the role of chemist. And they get given this well water sample from a theoretical well in Bangladesh. And they're asked a simple question. Is this safe to drink? And we tell them, according to the World Health Organization, what the recommended level of arsenic is in drinking water. And so just analyze this sample and tell us, is, is the arsenic level safe? Now, if you look, the World Health Organization tells us that drinking water safe levels of arsenic are 10 micrograms per liter. When they analyze this well water sample and they look over here into how much arsenic is in there, how many micrograms per liter of arsenic are in that sample? Okay, the chemists in the room are going, mm, mm, I'm doing the analysis. But uh, so, so you, you ha it, the system will tell you how many moles of arsenic are there. So to answer that very first question, they have to be able to do that analysis. They can go ahead and type it in, um, and they'll get immediate feedback. They can ask for some hints. But if it's really clear that they have no idea how to do that analysis, then we can put them into a just-in-time learning experience that basically then walks them through the stuff that we would have taught them before the did I get this. So this is kind of giving them the did I get this, up front. And so then we'd walk them through, give them a little walkthrough about how to do the analysis, some worked examples, some scaffolded problem solving, 
so that then they can actually solve this problem. So then they come back to the scenario, they get the next well water sample, they see if they can do the analysis. If they can, they can keep moving on. And in the second step of the scenario, they get told about a Bangladeshi chemist who's figured out how to use local clays to create a filtration system to take the arsenic out of the water. That clay has different absorptive capacities. So given this sample of clay, how often would a family of four have to change a water filter made from this clay drinking water at that level of arsenic? And so that constantly being put into real world problems and but through that learning the tools of uh, stoichiometry. So this is a part of what we're talking about is every step of the way the student can get help and feedback. And that ability to do things um, and get that feedback and refine their performance is part of the power of the environment. But the other power of the environment is it's not just the student who needs feedback on their performance, but other actors in this larger educational system. For example, the instructor. So as the student is working through all of those activities, not only are they getting feedback, but the system is collecting data on every move they make. Every time they type in an answer, every time they ask for a hint, every time the system gives them feedback, every move they make in the virtual lab, we're collecting it all. And that changes the dynamic of what an instructor can do in the classroom. So mm, rather than simply saying to the students, say if you teach on Mondays and Wednesdays, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so rather than saying on a Wednesday, read chapter 10 of the textbook, you could say to your students, work through module three of the OLI course and do all that task, do all the activities and finish that by say 10 o'clock Sunday night. And as the students working through that, they're getting the feedback, they're getting the support, but the system is also collecting all of those interactions. And from that, building a predictive model of the student's knowledge state, which we can then give to the instructor. So 10 o'clock Sunday night, you can bring up the instructor dashboard. Now this is an actual screenshot of a, an instructor dashboard out of a statistics class that's running in a local college. Not at Carnegie Mellon, this is uh, another college actually in California. So uh, let me just point out a couple things. This is out of our statistics course, not out of the chemistry or the engineering course. And the first thing is this module, which is on examining distributions, we articulate what are the learning outcomes for that module. And if you can see, they're all articulated in very student-centered and observable ways. So by the time the students finish this module, we want them to be able to do all of these things. The instructor can get a quick snapshot of where's my class. So the very top, so that bar on the left, that's a snapshot of the knowledge state of your class. So the students that are in the green part of the bar, what we're saying is our system would predict, based on the activities the students have done, that if you were to give your class an activity where they had to summarize and describe the distribution of a categorical variable in context, that those students, they'd nail it. The students in orange, those students are doing okay. Their, their le learning level is moderate, but they're still struggling a bit. The students in red, they're working, they're trying, they don't get it. The students in gray, anybody have a guess? Yeah, the students haven't done enough. They might be doing something, but they haven't done enough activities in the course for us to be able to give any kind of reliable prediction. So you can see how as a faculty member, the night before you're about to go into class, you could look at a profile like that and say, huh, it seems like I need to focus on this or not focus on that. But if you got a little more time, you could drill a little deeper. One way is you could click on any of those bars and see what are the sub-skills that make up that larger objective. For example, the, to relate measures of center and spread to the shape of the distribution and choose the appropriate measure in different contexts, one of the sub-skills that students need to be able to do is they need to be able to compute the median. Um, and what, what our system is telling us is that 
the students aren't doing so great on that subskill. So to the extent that the students are struggling, it may be the problem is they don't know how to compute the median. But you could click even further in and say, okay, where are the activities in the course in which they're computing the median and how are they performing on those activities? So you could look at this one and say, okay, so on this particular activity, most of the students are picking C, which is five, and I don't know if there are statisticians in the room, but you want to say, why might, why might they be picking five is the most common incorrect response. Yeah, a couple reasons. They might be confusing the median with the mode because there are uh, two fives there. They might be failing to put the, num the numbers in sequence before they look for the middle number. So there are many, um, many things that there that it could be, but you can get some insight into where they might be struggling. The other way, and you can also look at, well, what are the problem that they were actually doing that they collected, that we were collecting that data? So here's one of the, one of the tasks that the students are doing in which they're computing the median. And I show you this because what I want to make a distinction about is when we're telling you that the students are struggling with computing the median, we're not telling you that because we said to the students, okay, now we're going to compute the median. Here are 10 problems, 10 arrays of numbers, compute the median. And then they do, you know, if they get 7 out of 10, then we estimate what their skill is. What I'm talking about is we can embed that skill of computing the median in multiple authentic tasks. So the students are bringing to bear that skill of compute the median in the context of doing a larger task. And that's when we really care. Can they recognize that what I need to do is compute the median, and then I can compute the median, and then I can identify how that median has an impact on the larger question I'm trying to solve. So in this particular case, it's the readability of cancer pamphlets um, for patients. You had a question? So I have a backup bigger picture. Okay. Okay, so did everyone hear a question? Okay, so I never know if I need to repeat it. So so uh, yes, 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 yes. What we're doing is creating <laughs> What we're doing is creating these web-based environments and the way they get used, we leave that to the art and science of the faculty, classroom students that want to use them. So these courses, the original, it's true that the original design goal of these courses were just open educational resources for independent learners any place in the world. Because the Hewlett Foundation, who funded us originally, knew that if there was a student out there that just by gum, I want to learn statistics. You know, that natural human drive. I got to learn statistics. That, that there would be a resource out there that would support that learner. Um, but then also what happens, and so we, our first thing was really supporting independent learners. The second phase was then when faculty around the country started to say, oh, there's this cool resource that I can just point my students to uh, that's free and it gives them support and explains things better than the textbook. So I'll just point them there as supplemental material. And then we started thinking about, well, we're collecting all this data that would be really good for the faculty member to have. So how can we take the data we're collecting and represent it in ways that support the faculty member in class? And then that's when we started creating these instructor dashboards out of the data. So the way the courses currently get used is there are still independent learners out there that are just teaching themselves. They, they get used to support completely online courses. Um, they get used to, mostly they get used in hybrid mode. And so these are still students that are using the web accessible and some of these are using the web accessible? Okay. Sure. Um, the question was, are these just web accessible materials that a student can just go and click on? Um, that was basically the question. Yeah. Or are these things that are people that are paying for to access? So there are um, so there are two answers to that. Actually, all the courses are openly and freely available. You can send your students there at any point in time to just click on it and access it. We do not give credits. We don't even give. And although we're getting lots of requests, we don't give badges or certificates. We we don't do anything like that. What we do do is other faculty at other institutions 
use these courses to support their instruction. And so say if, if you're teaching and you're using the engineering statics course, um, you would be getting all the information about your student's performance and then you would give your students a grade and decide whether or not you wanted to give the student credit. Okay, so the question was, for faculty that are using this, do they still have a classroom and what percentage of time do they spend still in the classroom? And th again, that's highly variable. And in fact, how faculty are using this resource, it's, I, when I hear about it, it's really interesting. I'll just give a small example. The statistics course that I was just showing you the instructor dashboard out of, it was used in 60 different classrooms in different institutions last academic semester. And you know, it, it as varied as you know, Santa Ana Community College, just south of here, to Wesleyan, um, and then CSUN, one of your uh, uh, in your system uses this course. And it, even at CSUN, there are four different faculty that use the OLI statistics course, and they use it differently. So one uses it in a big lecture course, uh, it's, it's essentially at, in place of the textbook. Another faculty member uses it to support an honor statistics course where, you know, smaller class, like 35 students, and he has the students work on the OLI course completely outside of class. He says, You're, you need to learn this stuff before you come to class because then what we spend our class time doing is working on really interesting lab kind of small group problem solving. So, and then at uh, Wesleyan, they used it to accelerate the learning of statistics. So the first seven weeks, of the, I guess it's a 15 week course, they, the students w moved through all of the OLI material in eight weeks, and then the second seven weeks they spent doing project-based uh, learning activities. You know, pick something that's really important to you in your major and do a really interesting data analysis problem based on the skills that you learned. So, and then at uh, other places it's, you know, it's just used to in decrease the variability really in the, in the student learning experience. I just want to also show you that you can also click into on the detail of the student side. So each on the, that bar is made up of dots and each of those dots is a student. There are 40 students in this class. The instructor can click on any of section of that bar and see who are those students. Now since this was, this is a real course, I did remove the student names, but if you were the instructor, the names would be there. So you can look at who are those students and how many activities in this module have they attempted that's feeding that prediction. And then you could even click on any student and see for that student what's their learning profile. And then you can click in to see what activities has the student worked on that's feeding that, their, that prediction and, and what activities have they not yet worked on. So that if you're seeing that a student's struggling with a concept, how you respond may be different if the reason the student's struggling is they haven't really done very many of the activities or if they've done a lot of the activities and they still don't get it. I should say that this is also the view the student gets. So we call this the available practice report. So we do tell the students, these are your learning outcomes for this module. And if you're struggling, you can click by outcome and see where can I get some more practice or some more explanation in that particular outcome. So that brings me to what are the affordances of online technology? And when you ask people, usually you'll get one of these three responses. The first one and the most common one is convenience. Students can learn anytime, any place. Big power of the technology. The middle one is the capacity of the computer to create interesting learning activities that we can't create, it's difficult to create in the classroom. Like the simulation capacity. In, in chemistry or in biology, we can show students things at a m microscopic level, the interaction of molecules in equilibrium that is really hard to explain just by paper and pencil. We can have them experiment with simulations in that way. In engineering, we can have students build bridges and collapse them and nobody dies. So there's lots that we can do with that capacity of the environment. And then the third one is the one that a lot of people are excited about now, connection. 
that we can use this technology to connect students to material, to connect students to experts, to connect students to each other, to connect students to the world. And these three powers are great, but I submit that the real power of this technology in terms of improving education is something else. It is what Google has figured out. It's what Netflix has figured out. It's what Amazon has figured out. The killer app in these technologies is that you don't just push, use the technology to push the information out. You just push it out far enough that the student has to interact with your interface so you can use these technologies as great big data collectors. And you can use the data to give feedback to the student, give feedback to the instructor, but you can also, there are two other groups that really want that data. One of them is the course designers. We want to know, did that little thing that we tried to design to teach people engineering static, is it working? Or how do we target making it better? But the other group is learning science researchers. And this is sort of parallel to what Netflix is doing. They're trying to understand you better as a consumer so that they can target the things they offer you to your particular needs, but they're also trying to understand consumption patterns better. We're doing the same thing, but we're not trying to understand you as a consumer. We're trying to understand you as a learner, both so that we can target the learning experience better to meet your needs, but also so we can understand learners in general better so that we can design more effective learning environments. So how does that work? Well, the sister project to my project at Carnegie Mellon is a big NSF-funded learning research center called the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center, which is a collaboration, actually, between Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. And their whole reason for being is to define and refine theories of human learning. And they use the OLI environments as their big research lab. Because you can see the value of you can introduce, by just varying a learning activity, you can introduce actually tightly controlled experiments into these environments. But you have hundreds or thousands of students learning in real context so that you have the realism of real classrooms, but tightly controlled lab environments. And you can collect vast streams of data that will much more quickly allow us to refine our understanding of learning. And so here's, a, here's the same data that I was showing you that we showed the instructor, but a different representation that the learning researchers would like. So this is what we call a learning curve analysis. Now, do you remember when I was showing the engineering statics course and the student could go hint, 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 type in the answer. Hint, 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 type in the answer. Did that bother anybody? Yes, a lot of faculty kind of go, oh, um, my student's gonna do is go hint, 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 7.49. Hint, 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 3.73. And they're not gonna really use those hints in scaffolding to support their learning. They're gonna use it to just answer the question. And some students do. Here's the difference. We know. Um, and so the, the, what happens is every time they hit that hint button, every time they get feedback from the system, it increases what we call their assistance score. Every, so the y-axis on this graph is the assistance score. The x-axis is the number of opportunities they had to demonstrate that knowledge component. Now, a knowledge component could be like compute the median or use Avogadro's number. So um, this is the kind of learning curve we like to see. What does this tell us? Yeah, learning is happening. Learning is happening. So when they first were confronted with trying to demonstrate that knowledge, they needed a lot of support and feedback. Over time, they didn't. Now, Unfortunately, this is not how they all look when we first pull them out of the system. Uh, but it's an opportunity for refinement. So sometimes it starts up there and it kind of floats around up there. What would that tell you? Yeah, they're, they're doing what we ask them to do, but what we ask them to do isn't supporting a change in their knowledge base. They're not learning. Sometimes it starts down here 
and it kind of fluctuates down along the bottom. What would that tell you? Yeah, we're wasting their time. We're giving them lots of practice and support on something they don't really need practice and support doing. And then the ones that are really fun are when they kind of go along and then there's an inflection and they go up. Anybody, anybody got a guess on that one? <laughs> that could be it. Sometimes it, means, sometimes it means that we just misspecified the knowledge model. That something that the expert thought was a single skill or concept, actually at that point, we conflated something. And so at any one of those points, you can click on it and see what's the task that the student is engaged in that is creating that point. And so sometimes you know, the expert goes, oh, yeah, I see. That also includes you know, switching signs, not just uh, whatever. So, okay. So the other, the other final group is the course design team. So uh, OLI courses are not unlike most online courses. Want me. Oh, there we go. Are not built by individual faculty. Uh, we put together teams, uh, and the teams have multiple, usually multiple faculty, learning science researchers, software engineers, human computer interaction or user experience people, universal design for learning people, project manager that's kind of hold, holding it all together. And we bring this team together to make best use of that multidisciplinary knowledge to create the environment. So we start with, say, we're going to do, and, and I should say that it's not, a, it's not that we have learning scientists working over here telling them, the faculty, make sure that you inform your course by doing feedback. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's just extracting principles. Oftentimes, when there's something that's really challenging, like in the area of equilibrium, you know, people have been teaching equilibrium for years. And students just don't get it. Or they don't get it the way we want them to get it. They can pass the test, but then in the follow-on year, when they take the next course, it's clear that they just didn't get it. So in cases like that, then we bring the learning researchers and the, and the faculty together to try and unpack what's really the concept, what's really conceptually going on there that students are struggling with, and how can we shift the way that we're expose the way that we're presenting the material or having students engage with the material that will actually shift that conceptual focus. <laughs> then we have, so we have the core design, but then there are a lot of faculty who are like, this is cool, I'd like to participate, but boy howdy do I not have the time and energy to do that. So then there are other roles. Um, you could be on the review and contribute team, which is kind of looking at what the, as, as the course is being developed, reviewing parts of the course and giving feedback from your expertise or your experience. Or there might be some really cool thing that you do that you think this really helps my students get it, so I'll contribute that and they can think about what kind of design to make from it. Um, and then there are faculty that, um, that want to be part of the research but don't have time or energy or a different part of the process to be in any of those teams. Those are what we call the use and evaluate faculty. And those are, okay, we're just rolling out now the introduction to statistics course. Would you use it to support your teaching of your class? We'll collect the data that your class is throwing off and we'll also interview you from your experience when you were with your class, what were they really getting and not? And when they weren't getting stuff, what did you do to help them get it? Because that's good fodder for the design team. Yeah, yeah, but you're right. What we're talking about is a fundamental shift in the production function in higher education. And I'm not, and, and you know, I use the word course, but we should really unpack what do I mean by a course. What I'm talking about this group designing is the web-based, what we can do with a computer to support a course. What, uh, you know, there's still the part of the course where the faculty member is looking at the data that's being thrown off of the system and deciding, okay, how am I going to spend my class time based on, so what I think about it as, 
what we're, what we're really getting on the verge of doing is really thinking about how do we construct effective learning experiences. And there are many resources we can bring to bear. There's what a student can do with the computer. There's what a student can do with their peers. There's what a student can do with a faculty member. And all of those have real strengths and, and challenges. And so how do we create, in what context and under what circumstances, what kinds of blends of doing those kinds of things can we put together to really maximize the number of students we can actually support? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 And yes. And in fact, um, one of the courses that's not an open and free course, but that we're working on, is, is with the Software Engineering Institute on uh, information security, which we're trying to get them to open up. Pardon? Well, actually, we're we're in conversation. So look for it. <laughs> Look for it, because I have a compelling argument about why, why it's good to open things up. But yes, I mean, the, the notion of looking at course development as a continuous improvement process is exactly what we're trying to do, and using the technology to support that process. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so that's the, and that's the, um, that's the piece that we're just now really looking at. As these environments are being used in multiple institutions of Carnegie classification, if you will, and multiple contexts, really looking at what's the role of, how, how are the outcomes the same or different when you have different instructors, different students, different participants in the system? that are engaged, because it's not just the instructor, it's also the student that is part of the member of who's delivering the, the system. Yeah, yeah. I was waiting for that. It took, a, it took a little longer in this group. Usually that comes up much earlier, like right after the engineering statics tutor. But no, that's great. And I agree with you that, the, that when we were about to launch, and I invite anyone who wants to participate in this, um, an English, a first year English course. And the, um, what is the case is that the technology, the way that course looks, the apparatus, the activities in that course are going to be very different than the activities, say, in the engineering statics course. But the design process won't be. Because you still need to sit down. I mean, what we start with is, OK, you're about to ask students to spend 15 weeks of their time in your presence. Why? What is it that you expect them to get out of spending that 15 weeks with you? And that's a really interesting, when you start to really think through, what is it that I really want students to get out of spending this time? And then you start thinking about, okay, what kinds of things would I have them do that would both support them to get those things out of it, but also would allow me to observe what they're getting out of it in ways that I can then make uh, adjustments to. And so I would invite, so we're actually just gonna start doing a history course 
and an English composition course. And I'll let you know how that goes. But what's interesting is, uh, do we have chemistry faculty in the room? Okay, so, so for a lot of the, great. For a lot of the chemistry, you know, when I often, and it's interesting that you're chemistry faculty also, because when I've, off before when I've had chemistry faculty in the room with the humanities faculty, and the humanities faculty say, see how this would work for chemistry, don't see how it would work for humanities, I, you know, because chemi all chemistry is, is equations, fixed procedures, and if the students get the equations and the fixed procedures, great. And most of the chemistry faculty, I say, ah, that, 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 I want them to get that in high school chemistry, but that's not what I want them to get in college chemistry. And I had one chemistry faculty, I, always, I asked him if I could quote him. He said, what I really want is by the time they finish the intro chemistry course, I want them to be able to authentically participate in the domain of chemistry. That sounds way more like history, but it's, it's the idea that when, when you're confronted with some kind of novel situation, the perspective you bring to bear on that is informed by your knowledge of chemistry. Your approach is changed by this new perspective. And, and that's, uh, so you, you can articulate that, then we can say, okay, how? How, how do you know? How do you know when that's changed? And I'll often have faculty bring in um, artifacts of their student work. So, and sort of show me, show me students. So you gave them this task. What were you hoping they were gonna do with this task? Now show me the students that you think got it. Show me the, show me the artifacts where it shows the student didn't really get it. And let's see if we can unpack what the difference is. And then we can sort of say, okay, so to move students from this didn't get it to get it, what kinds of, what kinds of knowledge, what kinds of skills, what kinds of concepts do we need to support them to develop in order to move them along? Uh, yeah, go back there, they'll go there, they'll go there, yeah. No. So, okay, so his question was, there are resources for instructors to build courses. What we mean by that is actually very limited at this point in time. Um, what we mean by that is, so in the area of statistics, we have all of these modules, and you can, and we have a prescribed, this is, this is what probability and statistics at Carnegie Mellon looks like. So you can just go ahead and, using simple mode, just say, I want that course. Um, or you can go into advanced mode and you can select and sequence of the material that we've developed. So that we do not currently, ha or you can actually cross fertilize between content. So we have a statistical reasoning course and a causal and statistical reasoning course and an empirical research methods course and an economics course. And you can select and sequence across those to build something. But you can't, but you can't at this point in time, we do not have the tools at this point in time where you can go in and say, hmm, I'd like to build a course in um, world literature. Give me the tools and I'm gonna start building the course. We don't have that. What, the way that that happens is uh, you say, gee, I'd like to build a course in world literature. Let's see if we can get a couple things. Can we get a bunch of faculty who wanna build that course in world literature? Because we do a team development. And then the second thing is, can we get a foundation to fund it? <laughs> So that's, that's pretty much how it works right now. What we are building, though, is uh, a little bit close, getting close to that is we recognize that people want to be able to design stuff and build stuff in their own way, but run it on this platform so they can get the data back. That seems to be what people really want. And so we do have, when we're just starting now, we've created this uh, what we call platform system. Um, and we are, uh, we got funding to do this from the Gates Foundation for a particular population of faculty, and those are for the people who, uh, the Department of Labor did the TAC grant uh, to community colleges around the country. So for, for grantees who have won funding from the Department of Labor to do uh, open educational resource development in support of their TAC grant, the Gates Foundation is funding us to work with them to design the environment. That's one phase. The other one is to create this platform. So we've, we've just done two workshops for teams of faculty that are winner, winners of those grants to come to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we walk them through all the technology, how to, do, how to use the platform to do the design. We walk them through our design process, all of that, so that they can create their own courses and then we run them on our community server. 
but those will also be open educational resources. So the, the authoring tools aren't there yet, really, honestly, to say, here, everyone just use them, but we're working towards that. Yeah? Yeah, so that's a big question. So, <laughs> um, so business models um, that are going to sustain these things, there are many of them out there. I, I do have a, I, I kind of feel like the MOOC thing that's going on right now is a, at this point in time is kind of a lost opportunity. Um, and so I'm hoping that it'll, it'll um, transform in some ways in that the MOOCs are still, for the most part, just doing, you know, recorded lecture, really simple question sets and they're not they're not building they're not designing the courses based on any knowledge that we have about human learning they're not constructing the courses as big experiments where we can collect the data and refine our understanding of learning and and the the sadness about that is they've got huge n you know for learning research my gosh they've got the n they just haven't constructed the environment in a way that's going to allow us to really leverage that n so i'm hoping um, and actually working towards trying to shift uh, some of that approach to, to bring a more informed design process to MOOC design and also a research and data collection process to it. So just, uh, just really quickly say, so the upshot here is uh, better insight will give us better courses and we do these cognitive task analysis um, to, and we have demonstrated improvement in learning by doing these really intensive design processes. But the power of the technology is just what I was talking about, is doing this, getting that increase in equilibrium took a couple months of a learning researcher working with chemistry faculty to really unpack what's going on, think about the design, very labor intensive, very expensive. The new opportunity is using the data to help really bootstrap that. So we don't have, so we can spend some time up front in the design, but really mine the data to, to augment how we do the cognitive task analysis. So as I was showing this, like, like when you get a flat learning curve like that, that's a real discovery opportunity. So we have a bunch of results, which I won't belabor, but I've got published data because I wanted to get to this slide because this is where I wanted to end because I know we're gonna have questions and answers now. Um, but this is what I think is the real strategy for educational improvement. That in order to create better educational technology, we need a much better understanding of how people learn. We need much better learning theory. Learning science as a science is really quite young. Um, I always make the joke uh, to one of uh, my colleagues that, you know, the state of learning science right now, we know a lot about how sophomores in psychology at the University of Santa Barbara learn. Because if you're, a, if you're a psychology major, you have to, as part of your major, participate in all these lab studies. And so where there are these areas where people are really studying certain aspects of learning, we've got lots of knowledge. But we don't know a lot about learning in general. Um, so we need much better theory, and we use the theory to design the technology and then we use the technology as a great big data collector. And we use that data to refine our theory, to refine our technology, to collect more data, and so on. And this is why I think this process needs to stay inside higher education. It can't be exported to a commercial entity, and it can't, uh, and it has to be a collective, collaborative process because driving this loop is more than any single institution can do. Un un well, I should take that back. There are some institutions that probably uh, could do this by themselves, but most of us can't. Um, and so, the, oh, I should, I should pause back on that for a moment. These, <laughs> these are the current, uh, thank you to my funders. So we currently receive funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Lumina Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the Walter S. Johnson Foundation, and Carnegie Mellon also supports us. And the Learn Lab is funded by the National Science Foundation. And I'm going to close with my favorite quote 
from Herb Simons, who was a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon and also a Nobel laureate. And mm, I think 15 years ago, maybe almost 20 years ago, he said this. He said, improve, and it gets straight to your point, that improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. And at the heart of OLI is this. And what I'm inviting you to do today is be part of that uh, community-based research activity. So that's, I'll close, and then we can have our question cards, I guess. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to sit here. Thank you very much, Candace. And we do have some cards. We forgot to say write neatly. So <laughs> <laughs> I will do as best as I can we to. Um, your yeah, that would have been a plan. Um, but here's one. Oh, great. Thank you, Phyllis. That I can read. Um, are you familiar with Jane McGonigal? I'm looking to see if that's the right name. Work on gamification of learning. Your book, Reality is Broken. How does this model work with your work? So I think you'll have to explain a little, if you are familiar with that, what it is so the rest of our audience okay, can Okay, well, know. I'm actually going to just talk a little bit about, uh, put it up a level instead of sure. a specific theory around okay. uh, gamification, but look at what's the intersection of learning and gaming. Um, and, are we, and I guess the question is, are we doing any work in that? Yeah, and how does the model work with your work or relate to that? I think. Okay, so, um, so there are, you know, the, the intersection of gaming and learning science isn't, hasn't quite intersected yet. There's still kind of communities out there, like the learning science researchers are throwing off principles of learning, and the game, uh, the game community is throwing off principles of flow and game state. And people are trying to do usually one of two things. Look at, how do I take a game and make someone learn by using a game and inserting the content I, I, I write in it, or over on the learning side, um, or the other side of that. Well, anyway, wh what they need to do is kind of like what we're doing, which is instead of saying there are these two separate things and how can we take principles and inform each other, take on a challenge. Some particular, because we already do that first piece, like in our, I was, uh, share in our introductory computer science course that we're developing right now, we do have gaming elements in it, um, but they are gaming elements. And and I, what I would like, what I prefer, is to get the game designers and the learning researchers and the domain experts and the software engineers all together and say, let's let's pick a challenge, like uh, something that students don't get. And let's bring our diverse expertise together to see how do we how do we design something that would actually support students to achieve that. And we have not done that level of intersection yet at Carnegie Mellon, but I, you know, pull it in the Entertainment Technology Center in to, to start having those conversations. Great. Thanks. There's a couple of questions related to students, and they're some more general and some more specific. Uh, and some that relate specifically to OLI, but others that are just more generally for online learning, I think. So one of the ones I think that's more general is for students with, say, ADHD or blind or colorblind, dyslexic, or other learning, um, learning, I can't read it, but anyway, yeah, things with learning, learning okay, learning differences, how does that work? And are they excluded? The person is asking oh. that and how that might work. So, um, so when we started OLI, well, the reason I put this back up is because there's an impor important person on that slide, which is Universal Design for Learning expert. So um, when we started OLI, we did not have any of those people around, um, and we just we are now collaborating with an organization called CASP that is out um, in Massachusetts that are, it does all their work in Universal Design for Learning. Um, and so uh, on, on my staff, we don't have that expertise. So what we've done is brought in the expertise to participate in the collaborative development. And the first thing we had them do was a review of, you know, the OLI environment and certain OLI courses and say, how do we uh, essentially reconstruct these things to make them more accessible, more universally learnable. And, the, uh, and we're doing that work on the old stuff that we designed, but we found it's much better to start from scratch um, in the design to have that voice there. So, yeah, so I would say in answer to your question, the environment itself is um, accessible, 
the, the courses, some of the individual courses have varying degrees of, um, of difficulty. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, a, it's an area we're working on. And not just, I mean, there's the piece about how do you access it with a screen reader, there's that level of accessibility, but then there's also the acknowledgement that learners can take in information and express their knowledge in very different ways. And so do we have enough of a variety of activities that allow students and learners to both learn in different ways and also express their knowledge in different ways instead of having a, a thing. And that's one thing that technology is actually really great for. So, okay, I think picking up on that, there are a couple of other questions about students. One of which I think is asking about the kind of shift to self-learning, if you will. Is this good for, for whom? For teachers, for the schools, for the students? And um, maybe a, a related question is how then do we use these modes to increase and maintain student buy-in? It's written in the okay. question. So um, I think I understand the question. So <laughs> as you can tell from the apparatus, since we kind of know, we can get a pretty good picture of the student's knowledge state. One decision we could make with that is, well, given that this is where the student is and given that this is the outcome we're supporting them to achieve, we could just decide what to give them to do next. These very adaptive, personalized learning environments, which a lot of people are looking at designing. And we actually made a decision, at least for now, not to do that. Um, and instead, we're experimenting with giving the learner and giving the faculty the information about the student's knowledge state. Because in a, at a college level, we're not just trying to get the students to learn statistics. We're trying to also help them build better metacognitive skills about how to manage their own learning going forward. So as we're teaching them statistics, it's a good opportunity to start teaching them how to be aware of what they're, what they're learning and how to manage their own learning moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I should say that um, when we introduce these environments into different uh, contexts, the way that they're successful can be very different. In a particular community college that got, uh, faculty member heard me give a talk and got really excited about what we were doing. And she taught uh, statistics at a community college. And so she said, great, I'm gonna bring the OLI course in. I'm gonna, and so she had her first class. She said to her students, you know, do the, go, go work through module three. And then she, Sunday night, she brought up the instructor dashboard, was all excited to see what her student's knowledge state was. Anybody got a guess about what her dashboard looked like? Yes, it was gray. Mm -hmm. Mostly gray. I mean, there was like one green, you know, a couple are green, but mostly gray. And she went into class and it's like, what happened? You know, what? and I said, well, I didn't really understand. I tried to read it, but I didn't really understand. Could you explain what a box plot is? Well, sure. And so then she explained. And then she went right back into, you know, the traditional lecture mode. And the students went right back into their traditional learning mode. And the challenge, and so she, kind of said, she was really upset. She's like, this didn't work. You know, maybe it was a technology problem. Did they not know how to use the technology? And so we explored that. Was it the technology problem? No, it was actually a a, an idea about learning problem. That for these students, their idea of learning and their role in learning was, I come to class, I sit down, I have to come. I know I have to come to class. And during class, the instructor's gonna tell me what it is I'm supposed to know. I, as carefully as possible, write down what it is I'm supposed to know. In about a week, the instructor is going to ask me a question where I'm going to have to write that down again. And the fidelity with which I can tell back what the instructor told me means I learned. Very different approach than here are the learning outcomes we want you to achieve. Here are, act here are all kinds of resources and activities that's going to scaffold you to get there. And so, the, so what we did the second time she tried to teach it is we changed the, the introduction method. This is probably getting to some of your issue about the, in the larger organization in which this happened. So rather than just saying to students, go work through module three, she held the first couple classes in a computer lab and had the students working two to a computer and said, work through this module here in class. And now let's bring it back and let's talk about, you show me how to make a box plot. And communicating to the students, not only now do you know how to make a box plot, but now you've been able to successfully using this environment to support yourself to learn how to make a box plot. 
let's do that again. And it took about three classes of having the students meet in the computer lab, working with each other, working with the system, before they could actually then, she could say as homework, go work through this module, and then look at the dashboard. So some of it is, you know, it's scaffolding not just the knowledge, but it might be scaffolding a different approach to learning. I think, uh, kind of looking back at Gerald there, because your, your story about how students learn to learn reminds me a lot of a book that many of us have read here, the John Tagg's The Learning Paradigm. Learning Paradigm College, right? Yeah, now I blanked on the name. Isn't that it, Gerald? Yeah, the Learning Paradigm College, where uh, they've learned to learn in a certain way, and then you go to um, try to teach in a different way, and it, they have to learn to learn in a new way. Yeah. Arlene, did you have a follow-up on that particular one that you wanted to ask? Okay. Okay, well, then you have to get a car. <laughs> okay, I will, I'll keep you in mind then. Okay, um, I, but I've got another one along the lines of students here. Um, oh, great. Where I love someone had a focused. specific <laughs> example. We are a very student-focused campus. I see some of our students over there. So um, it's more specific to, you know, where's the student in the model, which I think you've talked about to some extent, but more specifically, do you see Vygotsky as a um, relevant framework? Oh, absolutely. Vygotsky is the zone of proximal development, where the idea is you want to give the students the task where they couldn't just easily do it, but they could do it with some support just outside of their current knowledge reach. And very much when we're trying to structure these tasks, we're trying to think about how, how you create tasks that are just beyond what the student can do, but then you have all the scaffolding and support immediately available to the student because you don't want them to get frustrated. Like you don't want to give them something that's just beyond their reach and they, can't, and they have no support and no resources to, to get there. So very much. Okay. Thanks. So this is an interesting one. How will OLI, and again, I think this could be also more broadly for online learning, accommodate social learning, i.e., and I have to read this because it's yeah, that's okay. very yeah, fun. My half-baked understanding is improved when I hear your half-baked idea. <laughs> so. Okay. So, um, so actually, I wanted to then just talk a little bit, and, and I added this slide to the presentation because of the meeting we had right before this because originally this wasn't in my original slide deck on this, for this one. But um, so, social, so uh, uh, OLI up to this point in time has very much focused on, because I'm at Carnegie Mellon, cognitive, cognition, the cognitive processes of learning. But we all know that there are many other facets uh, that go into a learning environment. And so our unit of study up to this point in time has been individual knowledge construction. How do we support an individual working with a computer to build their individual knowledge? Another group out of the University of Toronto, um, Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Bereiter, have a completely different focus of study, which is group knowledge construction. And they're looking at not just how do individuals learn, but how does a group learn? And how do you increase the knowledge of the group? And how do you distribute? How does expertise within a group become more distributed? So one of the things I'm a big fan, when I talk about a community-based research activity, that goes in both ways. That also means that we don't have to have all the learning research be in our group. That and rather than trying to develop all the, everything in a single group, look across institutions and say, who's doing interesting related research that we need to collaborate on? So we reached out to Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Bereiter, and we did some collaborative research together looking at could we combine the knowledge forum, knowledge scaffolded discourse environment with the OLI environment, and can we then also, by doing that connection, create an interface where students can work um, between both environments and increase individual knowledge and increase group knowledge and, and better distribute expertise. So this is an active area of research for us. But I wanted to show you is another kind of data representation, which this is the kind of data representation looking at this discourse environment. So you can see that uh, the, the, the expert in this system uh, initially is the teacher. So this is, a, this is a, a place where the students are interacting with each other, but the expertise is, is um, with the government. So we can look at. There okay. we go. So these are different knowledge representations where we're looking at not just um, the, 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 um, the knowledge, but also looking at the collaboration or the, the group knowledge construction. So you can look at where there's strong collaboration in the group, but weak 
uh, knowledge interaction. Or you can look at where there's weak collaboration, but there's strong pockets of knowledge. And then, uh, or you can look at places that we really like, which is strong knowledge and strong collaboration, where the blue spots are all people that are acting as experts. So you don't have just the teacher being the expert, but you have expertise being distributed as well as the, the web of knowledge being more tightly enriched. So, so you, can, you can create interactions in an environment where you can look at these kinds of things, not just procedural knowledge development. I wanted to show on that one. Oh, I was okay. Another example. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, Arlene's question, I think. Oh, I do want to add one. Yes. And so, uh, but there are many other dimensions. Like the, um, I've been recently talking with uh, Stanford uh, School of Education. Their dean, there, Claude Steele, um, who wrote, uh, who, whose work he was an experimental social psychologist, and most of his work was around stereotype threat. And so I'm really interested in looking at what are the cues in these online environments that are either um, exacerbating or diminishing uh, stereotype threat for learners who are engaging in these environments. Because it's, a, you know, these are, it, it's just such a great environment for conducting uh, social science research, too, because we could, we could, based on the literature, add cues or detract cues and see if it makes a difference. Okay, you mentioned Stanford, so now I have to have a question that has Stanford in it. Okay. And that's, uh, I gather that what distinguishes your OLI is your uh, focus on the science of, of learning, data mining that you've been telling us about. Uh, how do you envision this uh, within the context? Sure. Yes, you go ahead, Arlene, and I'll repeat it because I can't read it. Yeah, I mean, what I... Uh, Can I just uh, repeat that for one second oh, sure, for the recording? Ahead. Just Arlene was asking then, you know, with your focus on data mining and science of learning, and that's obviously what makes you unique, or uh, how do then does this interact, or how do you see it interfacing uh, with all the other big online initiatives that are out there from Stanford, MIT, UK, uh, internationally, United Kingdom, China, so on, India. Did I get it right? Okay. There okay. you go. So yeah, this is the true improvement. Uh, I, one of my software uh, engineers said to me, you know, Candace, true improvement in post-secondary education will require converting online environment development from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. <laughs> so, like, yes, you're right. So yeah, it, it, I feel like with OLI, there's a particular niche we have of where we're really focusing. And then there are other places that have depth of expertise in research and other niches. and and yeah, my ideal would be to create not the open learning initiative, but an open learning uh, consortium where people that are taking on different, uh, different questions in learning and have a depth of expertise there are working with different domain experts to construct learning environments that both help make traction on real problems in learning and also help us understand better human learning. And that's why I do think it needs to stay within, I mean, do stay within higher education, but within, but not within a single institution or a single faculty member. So, Candace, one of the um, things that we're very proud to have here in Monterey is the Defense Language Institute, and someone has asked a question about that, um, whether you either are familiar with or have had a chance to see how efficient the Defense Language Institute at the Presidio of Monterey is in their interactive language um, training through the internet, which they do for troops and units who are preparing for deployment. Cool. People I'm actually if you were not familiar, familiar with that. that work, but I would love to be. Mm -hmm. we, do have, um, in our, we do have a French, we have a French course and we're about to put up a Chinese, Spanish, and Arabic courses. But and the approach that we took to, you can look at the French course to sort of see the approach. It's very um, uh, interactive video based. It's not, um, yeah. Hmm. So. 
someone was interested in whether you can drill down and estimate the real cost to support your OLI development process, I'm thinking it's probably the grant amount, but yeah. anyway, <laughs> if you feel like you can give an estimate of that or? Yeah, you know, it changes. Uh, it changes because the costs are the, um, you know, because we've developed a lot of the platform. So that's not a cost anymore, to although we keep extending the platform every time some new thing is that we need to develop. So I guess there's ongoing software engineering costs. Then there's the learning science researchers costs who are consulting on the project. There's the project demand development person. And then the faculty, we pay faculty release time. That's probably the biggest cost. Um, so I would mm -hmm. say it costs about $500,000 um, a mm -hmm. course to build a, build a course from scratch. Um, because we have to pay all the faculty release time, fly faculty in. I mean, we, we do when we do a when we do a project launch, we um, bring all the faculty that are working on the project together for a couple days, and then we work in a distributed fashion. And then at various points, we might bring subgroups together. So I'm seeing a wave of shock because I think everybody would like five hundred thousand dollars, but uh, I think we have to go back to your slide that shows all the many many people that are involved in the course, and then that the courses are being deployed all across the country and beyond. Yeah. So it's and that's also kind of all the research, you know, you have all the data collection mm -hmm. and research and data analysis. There's still a lot to, to do. Okay, great. But that's why, I mean, I'll go back to the funder slide. That's why I have so many funders. Mm -hmm. Because like <laughs> yeah. a single funder couldn't afford it. Yeah. So uh, this sounds like somebody who's interested in, in helping with this kind of thing. They want to know what education or skills and background do people have um, that actually design the sites and interface with the, with the, um, that the students work with? Oh, okay. So um, as I say, uh, the different people on the design team uh, have a variety of expertise. Like there are, uh, I, I can go back to the, so the, the faculty domain experts usually are faculty in the domain. Um, although we do, like when we were doing the chemistry, some of the chemistry modules, we had you know, a full professor in theoretical chemistry, a postdoc in chemistry, a um, high school chemistry teacher, and a chemistry undergraduate, um, all on the same design team with the learning researchers and so on. And part of that was to help unpack some of the expertise, because the theoretical chemist would say, oh yes, so here I've done this simulation, it's obvious. <laughs> and <laughs> it's clear, the clearest depiction of equilibrium, and the, you know, high school chemistry teacher could look at that and say, hmm, I think I know what you're getting at, but it's not clear, you know. So, 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 that, so that's on the, on the domain expert side. Um, on the um, learning researcher side, a lot of cognitive, cognitive psychologists, um, social psychologists, um, and the computer scientists, uh, uh, interface design, user experience, mm -hmm. uh, human computer interaction, experts. So there's room for everybody in there's a variety room. of different and, skills. And I actually, we're starting a couple projects uh, right now. Well, the, one, the big one we're starting right now is English, uh, the first year English course. So if there are English faculty in the uh, room that would like to participate on one of those, you know, either um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. core development, review and contribute, uh, send me an email. And we're just and world history, right? right? You mentioned yeah, world, the world history. Yeah, the world history one, the, the English comp one is uh, is externally funded, so I can do the multiple <laughs> multiple things. Mm -hmm. The world history one, that is just we just started that conversation, and that is being completely internally funded right now by oh. Carnegie Mellon. So I'd have to, if we sketch something out, then I can go to one of my funders and say, hey, how about world history? And so I'm, we can we can look at doing okay. that. Um, and then there are a couple courses that we just, uh, that just finished their first round of design that are in the use and evaluate rapid feedback thing. And so I've got, uh, I need a lot of faculty that want to sort of use and evaluate and give feedback on that. And then, yeah. So if you're interested in, in participating in any of those ways, uh, let me know. And we have honoraria, for use and evaluate, we have honoraria that we do mm -hmm. uh, pay, not not to pay you to do it, but w that we recognize that engaging in experiments like that does take uh, time and energy. And sort of shifting how you're teaching to incorporate the different material takes time and energy. So, I saw Lila scribbling back there, and I believe that Phyllis is delivering a question to me. Oh, yeah, so still at cmu.edu. That's the email address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lila. Um, 
Lila is our chair of visual and public art, and she's wondering, could you please say a little bit more about to what extent, extent this would be applicable in the creative arts? Okay. Um, I, I prefer to turn that back. Does anyone have any? Uh, I mean, we did. We did. We have a school of drama, at Carnegie Mellon, and we did. We've done one course in our school of drama, which was an American, um, an American speech course. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to hear, uh, uh, like, what kinds of things in creative arts we could do, and different ways we could explore using the technology and what we want students to get out of it. I would bring to bear the same design process, but I don't have a fixed answer mm -hmm. of, oh, this is what we could do. I imagine the folks that are teaching creative arts probably yeah. have some Lots really of creative ideas, ideas about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Exactly. yeah. exactly. Exactly. But it was funny because they had, um, the Gates Foundation sent a videographer to kind of look at some of the classes at Carnegie Mellon that are using OLI to kind of get a sense of what's the classroom look like. And so they sent, the videographer went and looked at the um, logic course. And then they went and looked at the drama course where they were using the speech thing. And it couldn't have been more different. I mean, in the drama course, uh, the students were doing somersaults and reciting poetry. You know, it was just, it's like, yeah, see, it doesn't, it doesn't constrain what happens in the classroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have two final questions, one of which is quite specific and the other of which is more general. So we'll, the more specific one, someone is asking, are you familiar with WebAssign, uh, Mastering Physics, Sapling learning or others? Do these paid systems offer anything that yours do not? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I am familiar with all of those, and they have huge question banks that we just don't have. Huge question banks. Um, so I would say that that's what they that they offer that we can't get anywhere close to. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm gonna just anecdotally. Every once in a while, you're allowed to speak from anecdote. My son um, was a, uh, in his senior, uh, when he was a senior in high school, he was taking calculus. And um, the, and they were, the faculty member, the teacher, was using WebAssign. And at the first part of the semester, they didn't have WebAssign. They were, and so what the teacher would do would be assign a paper and pencil calculus problems. And what my son and his friends would do is after school, they would get together and they would work through the problems and they had these, I would listen in, they had these really rich conversations trying to work through the problems together. Then they went to WebAssign and, uh, and the way the WebAssign worked is it would give, the, give them each their own personal problem to do. You had to solve the problem and then type the answer and put it back up in to the WebAssign thing which would then immediately evaluate it as correct or incorrect, accepted or not accepted and if it wasn't accepted they, it would give you another problem. And I watched my son doing that. And it was such a contrast, because he would work it all out, and then he would post it in WebAssign and make some kind of dumb error, like forget the you know, reverse assign or something like that, and it would say incorrect and give him another problem. And he'd be like, yeah, it's, it, I, I know how to do it, it's just I typed it wrong. You know, and, he, and written on his paper it was right, it's just he made a typing transcription error. And so it went from enjoying doing calculus homework and really learning things to it being this real task of making sure that he typed everything in specifically <laughs> correct. The other thing that happened is a friend called him and said, you know, I'm struggling with this particular problem. Um, da -da 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 -da. And, but it was a completely different problem than the one my son was working on. So that rich conversation of really discussing how to approach the problem, what to do next, da 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 because I, I can't see what you're talking about. I don't know, you know, I don't know. And it broke what I thought was a really rich, um, so, so my concern is, and this is what I mean about the appropriate use of technology. You want to look at what's the impact of introducing any of these technologies, WebAssign, OLI, et cetera, into the learning experience and make sure that you're supporting the kind of learning behaviors you want to support and not essentially disempowering learning behaviors that you want to mm -hmm. encourage. Mm -hmm. Great. So several people asked a question along the lines of, um, is this truly an example of a disruptive innovation in education or is it a sustaining innovation uh, per Clayton Christensen? Clayton which Christensen. We should probably direct that question to our president, but yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, going to let you tackle it. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, a, a classic, oh, wow, I 
that's a lot. There's a long answer. To yes, that I know. But, <laughs> that's but, why I left it to last. So, um, so I guess there are parts of it that are disruptive and parts of it that are sustaining. I would say. I think actually the most disruptive part is this notion of a community-based research activity. I think the two pieces that are kind of disruptive are the evidence, uh, the move to evidence-based practice, and then the move to community-based practice away from individual practice. And the like the the most of the MOOCs that are out there aren't in that shift. So mm -hmm. people look at those as disruptive, but in some ways I think a lot of the MOOCs are um, they're not necessarily even sustaining, but they're reinforcing parts of higher education. Mm -hmm. But they're not, I mean, part of the disruptive innovation is are you serving a population that historically is unserved mm -hmm. by the current method? And are you serving them better than what was being served before? And then you're moving up the innovation change where where th that population is being better and better and better and better served. I would argue that, the, that most of the MOOCs that are out there are not serving an unserved population. Most of the MOOCs out there are serving people that have already been pretty much well served by higher education. And maybe, and maybe they're unserved in that they need to extend and further their education. But the, the mass population of people who want and deserve higher education that don't have access to it right now Either because they're because they're they don't have the preparation to participate fully. I don't think the MOOCs are serving that population well. I think that the kinds of things that we're developing could uh, support serving those populations better, but serving them in the context of what would look more like a traditional higher education. Thank you, thank you very well, much. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you, Candace. The president uh, is going to come back for a moment. Candace, stay for one oh. second. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights with us sure. and launching our speaker series. We have a little present for Yay. you. Here for the <laughs> Thank you. And there's a reception, yes? Yes, we have a reception. Everyone is invited to join uh, us for a reception right here outside the door. <laughs>